Hello students, I hope you're enjoying your forced vacation. If you recall, we had a little joke about this at the beginning of the semester and we all thought something like this would never happen, but we get surprises in our lives and this is one of them. So this will be the beginning of a series of movies that will attempt to supplement the uh, book and uh, the material which you have previously learned from lectures. Uh, this is my first try, so it might be a little rocky. I hope you will bear with me and realize that uh, old people sometimes have trouble with technology. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll try my best to catch up and keep you uh, abreast of uh, the information that we would have covered had we been able to in class lecture the rest of the semester. Last time we met, we discussed uh, firearms identification issues and I uh, indicated that we needed to cover collection and preservation of firearms. So that is what we will try to do now. Firearms found at the scenes of crimes are a special uh, type of evidence for numerous reasons. First, they are uh, a potential uh, hazard, obviously. If they discharge when you don't want them to, <laughs> then uh, that's big trouble. Uh, and they seem to be uh, kind of a magnet for uh, First responders, they, they all carry guns. Most of them like guns, and so they have a tendency to want to pick them up and look them over before they uh, realize, oops, this is a, a piece of evidence that we need to preserve and protect. So uh, that's the first thing you need to uh, be aware of is uh, make sure that everyone is aware that there is a gun and that it hasn't been processed and it hasn't been collected and leave it right where it is, don't go over and check it out. Uh, then the next thing you have to think about is uh, how am I going to collect it? And as with all other kinds of physical evidence, first thing to do is photograph it using the procedures that we've learned previously. And then once it's been photographed and documented, you need to consider uh, what evidence might be on the weapon that could possibly be disturbed with, if you handle the gun. So that would include DNA, that would include uh, fingerprints and, uh, and other trace evidence that might be uh, present on the gun. You should, of course, wear gloves, uh, as you should with collecting of all evidence. Uh, and so that will uh, somewhat reduce the possibility of you leaving your fingerprints on the gun but gloves will certainly wipe other people's fingerprints off, so uh, that doesn't uh, uh, eliminate the need for caution. Uh, fingerprints on guns are relatively uncommon. Guns are not a good surface for fingerprints, as I've mentioned previously, uh, but we still need to uh, protect them in case they are there. They're, of course, wonderful evidence when we have them. So uh, we need to think of what kinds of things might create uh, or lessen the uh, possibility of destroying fingerprints. Uh, naturally, if you have a very rough surface like a checkered grip on a, on a, a gun, the likelihood of a usable fingerprint being on that is low. So you may, if you're careful, pick the gun up uh, in, in a manner that you're only holding the, the checkered surface or uh, a small surface like the edge of a trigger guard. Uh, once in a while on TV, uh, you see some detective uh, pick up a pencil or other uh, small rod and stick it in the barrel of the gun to pick it up. That, of course, is, is, is bad procedure and you know what I would say about that, which is, change the channel. It's a terrible show. So, uh, I mean, if you pick something up, you don't put anything down the barrel of a gun. 
you might disturb the riflings and the other fine striations that are present in there, but it might also discharge. Uh, it's just not good practice. So we don't put things in the barrel uh, of, of any kind. So uh, when you've uh, picked up the gun, the next thing you want to think about is rendering it safe, which means, uh, first of all, let's get the ammunition out so that the gun doesn't discharge uh, and um, it depends on the weapon how you remove the ammunition uh, if it's a uh, revolver which I will show you in this picture this is a picture of a uh, revolver that has a, a swing out cylinder meaning that you can swing the cylinder out from the barrel and access it. This type of revolver allows you to remove the cartridges, sometimes one at a time, sometimes all of them at once, depending on the mechanism in the gun. Some revolvers allow you to completely remove the cylinder, which uh, then you nearly uh, keep the cartridges in the, re in the cylinder uh, for future reference. Prior to removing the cylinder or exposing the cartridges in the cylinder, you should mark the cylinder so that you know the position it was in when you received it. This allows you to know if the round under the hammer is uh, fired or unfired. Uh, in a suicide, for example, it's important to know if the uh, round is not under the chamber, the fired round is not under the chamber, then uh, there's, that's pretty good evidence that perhaps they, uh, they didn't shoot themselves, but uh, someone else uh, fired the gun and uh, the cylinder was moved. You can mark the cylinder with a, uh, simply scratching it with a, uh, a diamond tip scribe, or you can mark it with a sharp uh, tipped sharpie, uh, simply so that you can know, okay, this, this uh, round was under the hammer uh, at, uh, at the time that the, the gun was found. You can then remove the rounds one at a time, photographs them, and mark them and package them separately, uh, marking the one under the hammer as uh, number one, and then uh, rotating either clockwise or counterclockwise, uh, uh, counting each one as you go and giving it a new number. The next picture is of a semi-automatic weapon and shows where the magazine is in many semi-automatic pistols. That is, it slides into the grip. The, the magazine in this case is the uh, dark uh, rectangular shaped device that protrudes from the base of the, of the uh, handle. This is an extended magazine and most magazines uh, are not that long. They, uh, they stop at the bottom of the, of the handle. I just used this one so that I could show where the magazine is. Removing the magazine will remove all of the extra cartridges from the weapon but will not, I repeat, will not render the gun safe. There will still be, or possibly be, a round in the chamber, which is certainly the most dangerous place because that's where they are when they're fired.
once the magazine has been removed, you should photograph it and remove all of the rounds and photograph them, keeping track of which ones were on top and what the sequence is for all of the rounds. Uh, then the next step in rendering it safe is to remove the cartridge from the chamber. This is done in various ways depending on the weapon, but for a semi-automatic handgun, if you open the action, slide the action open, that will remove the round from the chamber. That, of course, should be saved separately, photographed, and marked, and the action should be left open uh, for uh, future packaging and transport. To illustrate the importance of these steps, I will relate a case which occurred not uh, too long ago in which uh, some young men were having a party at a lake and uh, one young man brought out a semi-automatic handgun to show the others. In the process of showing it to them, he removed the magazine, opened up the action, and thought the gun was safe. Then, unbeknownst to him, this particular kind of weapon, this particular gun, when you replace the magazine, it closes the action and reloads a round in the weapon ready for firing. He thought it was empty because he'd taken all the rounds out, but when he put the magazine back in, it reloaded the weapon automatically, and when he pointed it near his brother's head, it discharged and killed his brother, for which he was enormously sorry and remorseful. Firearms, like all evidence, must be identified for court purposes and for uh, any other future identification. Some officers mistakenly believe that they need only to write down the serial number of the gun to identify it. In the United States, it is a law that any firearms that have been manufactured in the last 20 years need to have a uh, unique serial number. However, different manufacturers or the same manufacturer of different models of weapons may reuse that serial number. So in order to identify a weapon, in addition to having your mark and your regular identification on the weapon, you should write down the make, model, cartridge name, and serial number for future identification purposes. Once the gun is rendered safe, you can uh, package it for transport. There are special gun transporting boxes that are available that some departments use. Ordinary cardboard box with a bottom works all right. You should place the gun in the, in the box and secure it either with zip ties or string or something that will not allow the gun to move around in the box. Uh, seal the box, mark it, and uh, ready to go. After uh, the gun has been taken care of, the next topic will be cartridge cases. Cartri fired cartridge cases uh, are very, very valuable evidence in some cases. Uh, they allow you to determine what gun was used and they also may be helpful in reconstructing the events. Therefore, the uh, location of the cartridge cases is oftentimes very important. Uh, weapons eject cartridge cases uh, in a relatively uh, uniform manner so that uh, the location of cartridge cases may help to determine the location of the gun at the time of firing. 
So each individual cartridge case should be marked, measured, and photographed, and uh, subsequently packaged separately. You should wrap the cartridge cases individually in soft uh, material such as tissue or uh, soft cloth and package them so that they don't get fu uh, any future uh, damage to them. Uh, each case should be in its own container with its own number, its own uh, uh, item number and mark. Cartridge cases, as we talked about, have um, value in making a comparison to the weapon. They also may contain evidence on their own, which could be fingerprints. Cartridge cases are uh, small, and it is not common to find fingerprints on cartridge cases, but uh, we are careful not to disturb them so that they can be fingerprinted when you get to the laboratory. So don't wrap the material tightly, wrap it loosely and uh, don't rub it or uh, do anything that might wipe away the fingerprint evidence. DNA evidence, of course, is also possibly present. And uh, as long as you're careful in packaging, you shouldn't, deter, uh, shouldn't uh, destroy that DNA. The uh, marking of a cartridge case is uh, somewhat optional. Uh, I know that I said each piece of evidence should be marked. Cartridge cases, if you need to mark them, should be marked inside the mouth of the case. If you make marks on the outside, that may interfere with the, uh, the marks made by the firing of the gun, the breech face marks, the firing pin marks, the ejector marks, and so forth. So the only safe place is inside the mouth, uh, which sometimes is... Uh, in, in small cartridge cases, uh, uh, not very practical. So uh, oftentimes I don't mark them. I simply mark the uh, container that they're in and make sure that uh, they're all photographed and they're all separate and we can know which one was where. We had a case where uh, a man was shot uh, numerous times and uh, cartridge cases were found and the gun was also found, a, a gun was found very close to his body. So they, uh, they thought everything was, uh, you know, understood. They picked up all the cartridge cases, put them in the same container. Subsequently, it was determined that there were two guns used. The second gun was found outside the house uh, uh, sometime later. And uh, we knew when, once we got, a, got suspects, there were two suspects, and we knew which gun was handled by which suspect, and we also knew which uh, gun fired the bullet that actually killed him, the one that went into the head versus some that went into his torso. But we couldn't uh, determine which cartridge cases were from uh, which uh, sequence or which position because they had been all mixed together and so therefore we, we, we were diff had difficulty reconstructing the scene. So just make sure we keep them separate, make sure we mark them appropriately and uh, keep them, you know, a a out of uh, harm's way. You don't have to worry about, of course, temperature or environmental conditions like you do with biological evidence because they, they they don't decompose, <laughs> they're fine. Next, we will discuss bullets and their collection preservation. The bullet, of course, is the projectile and is separate from the cartridge case. The bullet has markings for, that are uh, from the barrel of the gun and allow you to determine if a particular bullet was fired from an individual gun in most cases. So uh, again, we need to uh, photograph uh, and measure and mark the uh, bullets, the location where they were found. If the uh, bullet is in a 
place where we can easily collect it, then we should uh, pick it up carefully, uh, making sure we don't disturb any potential uh, DNA or fingerprint evidence. Uh, oftentimes, bullets that have been in a body or have passed through a body will have uh, blood and tissue on them. This should not be lost because we need to use that to determine that the particular bullet was the one that, that went through the body. Uh, so rather than uh, wash it off, we should simply pat it dry with a uh, tissue or cloth and save, dry and save the cloth, which has the blood stain on it, and then uh, dry the bullet. Uh, bullets that have blood on them, if they're left for long periods of time, the blood can corrode the markings on the, uh, on the bullet and, and render them uh, difficult to, to make a match. So you should make sure you do get them dry, but don't, don't wash them and then dry them. Just pat them dry and, uh, again, save the whatever tissue or cloth you use to pat it dry. And then we've got a blood sample, but we've still got the gun and the bullet protected. If the bullet is in, embedded in a, uh, in a wall or in a, uh, some other object, uh, we don't pry it out. We uh, cut a, an area around the bullet hole and uh, remove a block of the material, uh, of wood or plaster or whatever it is, and then we can crack that open very carefully and find the bullet. If you go probing around in there with a knife or a, a metal rod, you can damage the bullet and, and, and make it harder or even maybe impossible to uh, match it to a gun. So, uh, you know, just take it, remove the bullet carefully and, and, and don't use metal or hard uh, objects to scratch it or pry on it or, or uh, loosen it from, from its housing. Uh, sometimes bullets separate uh, upon impact and we need to collect all of the fragments that we can and uh, paying particular attention to uh, the jacket material or the coating material on the gun. Uh, the, the lead core is not as uh, important. It doesn't uh, allow us to, uh, to make a match. We can't make a match from the lead core uh, of a jacketed bullet but we still need to collect it and uh, preserve it in the same way that you would a bullet that was intact. Marking bullets is uh, also a pretty specific job. We know that the marks on the bullet that are made by the interior of the, bar of the barrel are along the uh, outside surface of the bullet, and so we don't make any marks on the outside uh, of the bullet, on the, on the sides. If we must mark it, then you can maybe mark it on the base of the bullet, because that doesn't touch the barrel. But uh, personally, I don't, I don't usually mark bullets. I wrap them carefully in, in, in soft material, separately marked and packaged separately. Uh, and identified separately, and uh, I don't make a mark on them on the bullet. Another type of physical evidence that is included in the uh, firearms chapter in your book is tool marks. Tool marks are marks made when a harder material leaves an, its image in a softer material. There are lots of examples of tool marks at crime scenes. They can be uh, pry marks made when a, a burglar is prying open a door or window. They can be uh, marks left by the tools that they use to break the doorknobs, such as uh, 
vice grip or other large pliers. They can be uh, marks left by any kind of uh, metal scratches. Uh, I have done tool mark examinations on wires that have been cut and have the mark of the uh, tool blade on the cut surface. The, uh, the opportunities for uh, the possibilities for tool marks are virtually limitless. Due to the nature of tools and the manufacturing processes, even though the manufacturers attempt to make them as smooth and even as possible, they always contain small striations and scratches similar in many respects to those found in the inside of gun barrels. So sometimes a firearms and tool marks examiner can make a comparison between marks made by a tool and determine that they were made by the same tool. So whenever you find a tool mark, consider there are basically two kinds. One is the uh, indented mark, which is made by the mere pressure of uh, sinking in to the recipient object by the tool, such as a pry mark, such as a squeeze from a pair of pliers or a pair of uh, other tools. And the other type is uh, images made when the tool slides across the surface. The first kind are basically three-dimensional, the second kind are two-dimensional. In general, three-dimensional images rarely contain individual marks allowing us to match a particular tool to the mark. Uh, the uh, two-dimensional images usually have sufficient detail that if we can reproduce the uh, marks sufficiently, we can make a positive comparison. The uh, first thing, of course, is to recognize them. They may, uh, they, they may take the mark and uh, be, it may be obscured or uh, hidden or covered with dirt. Uh, in any event, the uh, three-dimensional marks are always photographed and, uh, if possible, removed. The mark, if it's on a damaged uh, doorknob or window pane, the uh, homeowner is likely to uh, not object to the window pane or broken doorknob being taken. If that's not possible, then good photographs are about our only uh, opportunity. There are some materials that have been used to uh, reproduce the mark, such as silicone rubber and uh, various other casting materials. They usually make a good gross image, but are normally not sufficiently clear to make uh, positive identifications. If you are uh, lucky enough to uh, obtain a tool, then the uh, next trick is making marks by that tool. If it's on a, uh, on a wire, the uh, investigator should bring you sufficient wire to make additional cuts with the uh, suspect tool. When you recover the suspect tool, however, you need not, you should not make those cuts yourself. You should simply bring in some wire that has been cut with another tool and let the examiner uh, examine the tool 
oftentimes there is uh, paint or uh, other material on the uh, surface of the cutting edge of the tool that can be compared to the uh, paint or debris from the uh, victim object. We once uh, received information about a uh, theft in Salt Lake County in which uh, the uh, bandits uh, recovered or stole uh, $3,600 from the safe of uh, the victim. They actually uh, took the safe and, and the money was in it. And they subsequently found the safe out in a field that it had been beaten open with a sledgehammer. So they brought us the safe and we examined it. We found uh, blue paint on the safe in the area where it had been struck with the hammer. Uh, several weeks later, they recovered, the, the police department recovered a, a hammer from the trunk of uh, some suspects and they brought us the hammer and on the hammer was uh, gray paint that matched the paint on the safe and blue paint which on the safe which matched the paint that was used to paint the hammer. In addition, there were marks on the face of the hammer that corresponded to the shape and size of the dial on the safe where it, the hammer had struck the, the dial so hard that it left an image in the face of the hammer. So uh, this was uh, a, a perfect example of what I consider not very smart criminals. If I got $3,600, I'd go buy a new hammer. Uh, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't leave it around in my trunk for the police to find. But uh, once again, that's the ones we catch. The smart ones don't make those kind of mistakes or they commit other crimes that we have more trouble solving. <clears throat> In any event, tool marks are valuable and uh, you need to consider them and uh, recover them as best you can and uh, make sure you can uh, bring in standards when that's applicable, uh, such as the excess wire and so forth. The final section in that chapter on firearms deals with shoe prints, not footprints. We rarely see footprints at scenes of crimes, but we often see shoe prints at scenes of crimes. Uh, shoe prints may be considered by some as old-fashioned and not very valuable. But there are a number of people who have served prison time because of shoe prints, which I have uh, examined and testified about. They are, in fact, very good evidence and uh, may be overlooked a little bit, but they shouldn't be because there are oftentimes characteristics on shoe prints that allow you to make a match that's uh, as strong and uh, reliable as bullet comparisons, for example. Basically, there are two kinds of shoe prints, just like there are two kinds of other tool marks. We have uh, shoe prints that are embedded in soft material, such as mud or sand, and shoe prints that are on the hard surfaces such as uh, a tile floor or uh, a piece of paper or vinyl. One of my favorite cases was a shoe print on a vinyl checkbook. This was uh, compared to a shoe that belonged to 
a man whose father I had previously testified against as he had committed a burglary. Uh, in any event, the shoe prints uh, matched and uh, a, a very good case was made. So let's take the uh, two-dimensional flat, flat hard surface shoe prints first. They are uh, sometimes made when uh, a criminal kicks in the door and leaves a shoe print on the door, or they uh, scatter things around on the floor when they're committing burglaries and step on them. So we need to be looking for them and uh, always be aware of the possibility of shoe prints. Uh, Two-dimensional shoe prints oftentimes can be treated like fingerprints. That is, they may be dusted and uh, lifted in the same procedures as fingerprints. They, of course, uh, need to be photographed, measured, and uh, a ruler included at some point in the photography so that they may, may make uh, measurement comparisons later on. The uh, three-dimensional shoe prints uh, oftentimes are uh, more difficult to handle and usually have less fine detail than the uh, two-dimensional prints. That's because the uh, soil particles, the little granules of soil, are not uniform, and so we don't get nice, uh, even... Uh, lines that uh, represent the pattern of the sole of the shoe print. But uh, the first thing we do with a, a, a three-dimensional shoe print is, of course, to uh, photograph it. And that requires a bit of uh, technique because the indentation alters the shadows that fall upon the surface. So it requires you take uh, several photographs from different angles or bring the light in from different angles to uh, enhance the uh, image and enhance the, uh, the detail. You should uh, very carefully uh, pick out any loose debris that has fallen in the print and then uh, photograph it and then you can consider making a cast. Uh, cast is uh, like uh, you can use plaster of Paris. You can use uh, various other casting materials, which are uh, probably more expensive and more difficult to get than uh, plaster of Paris. In any event, uh, after you've cleaned the print up a little bit, uh, you, you simply mix up the plaster and very carefully uh, pour it in. Oftentimes, I will... Uh, take the, uh, a spoon and, and pour the plaster into the spoon and let the plaster run over the edges of the spoon rather than just pouring it into the print where it may damage by the, just the force of the plaster hitting the spoon. Sometimes the uh, prints are uh, fragile so that when you uh, try to, to cast them, they cave in or they uh, won't hold their shape. So... If you think that's the case, you can, uh, before you you uh, put in the plaster, you can harden them up a little bit with some uh, spray varnish or even hairspray, holding the can sufficiently far away that the spray doesn't damage the print, and a couple of layers of that will firm it up so that you can make a cast. Uh, plaster casts uh, oftentimes lack the really, really fine detail that is present in uh, two-dimensional prints, but uh, you can get good size and good uh, pattern uh, information from the plaster cast. And sometimes if there are some uh, obvious defects in the sole, uh, such as a cut or a, a, a hole, then uh, you can uh, make a, a, a match to a shoe from a shoe print. At least you have the class characteristics 
that you can compare to. Uh, uh, I have seen situations where uh, investigators have placed the shoe in the print to see if it fits. That's taboo. We never put a tool in the in the in the tool mark because the 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 procedure of putting the tool in there will alter the tool mark. And of course it fits. If you force the, the shoe down into the shoe print, of course it will fit. You've made it fit, but it's, uh, of course it's just bad procedure. So we just don't ever put a tool in, in a tool mark, whether it's a shoe print or a pry bar mark or a whatever kind of a tool mark. That'd be like uh, taking the bullet from the body and putting it through the barrel of the gun again to see if it fits in the barrel. Uh, anyway, so there's uh, things you can do with shoe prints besides uh, casting them. If there's a, a series of shoe prints, you should look at them and, and measure the distance from the tip of one shoe print to the tip of the next, which gives you what's called the step length. And the, the faster you move, the longer your step length is. So you can oftentimes determine whether the person was standing or walking or running. Uh, some people have uh, unique uh, positions that they hold their feet in while they're walking. I, for example, uh, suffered a, an injury to my left leg when I was young in college, and, and I turned my left foot out. So instead of my shoe prints being parallel the uh, left shoe print points out and uh, once in a while you can see one of those idiosyncrasies and it'll help you to say well this is the same pattern that that uh, we saw at another burglary for example the uh, the other thing is if uh, if you're walking uh, carrying a heavy load you'll tend to turn both of your feet out and so that can give you an indication that someone is, uh, you know, they've broken in and stolen a TV and they're carrying it or, or whatever. Uh, so you should examine the pattern of several shoe prints together to see if there's anything that's unusual or unique about them. And uh, if, you, if you have a one, one step that's shorter than the next step, then that uh, typically means the person is limping. And you will you will take the shorter step on the whatever foot it is that hurts, so you can say what this person is limping and they must have an injured left foot because that's the step they're spending the least time on. So uh, examine the patterns of the shoe prints as well as just individual uh, shoe prints. There is a uh, I think we mentioned it earlier. I think there's a there's a uh, shoe print database that is uh, out of Europe. I think it's out of the uh, United Kingdom that uh, you can pay and have them uh, examine a shoe print and maybe tell you the kind of shoe that made it, but I've never used it, so I don't have any personal knowledge about it. Shoe prints are good evidence, and we should pay attention to them and collect them whenever we can. And uh, so then there's, uh, that's, that should be about the end of the chapter on uh, firearms. We'll uh, end this now and uh, the next segment will be on the next chapter, uh, the chapter on drugs. We're going to skip for the time being the uh, chapter on blood stain patterns and come back to that chapter when we talk about blood and uh, bodily stains uh, at a later time.